premieres, full-length episodes, and all new content. Subscribe to The Honest Luke Show on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. We used to, in the, in the Nimrod, so you had a microphone. The idea was that you could kiss your microphone. All right. That was the idea. Done. Well, no, I'm not going to kiss this guy. Freaking, <laughs> we'll, we'll both get COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Come a bit closer. A bit closer. Okay. One, you, two. You, you do need to. You need to. I'll write on top of it. Yeah, about about an inch. Go about an inch back. One, two. Oh, you saw you kiss it. Then. Yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> One, two. Right, so we're recording on here. I'm recording on that. The GoPro's recording. <laughs> Graham can. That's a pretty good setup, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's just yeah. um I mean these microphones are cheap, aren't they? Well, my microphone isn't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is. <laughs> Yours is the uh well, I invested in uh, my own microphone. But no, as you can see, look, it moves yep. very very right. nicely and that one is very rigid. <laughs> no, it's on a mic it's on a oh no, it's on a microphone stand. I thought it was a microphone stand at first. It's it's the same boom arm, but it's um yeah, it's significantly cheaper. Um but this is actually the first show I've ever recorded, so I'm really relying on you to carry me through it. Let's just get going. Um, but so, I just want to quickly say at the start, this is episode one, fingers crossed, and the date is... Oh, Jesus. Is it the 21st? Uh, no, 19th was Monday. The 19th was Sunday. The 22nd, is it? It's the 22nd today. Thursday, the 22nd of April, I've got Graham Hatters in here. Um, for episode one, um, I did have a list of what do you firstly, what do you think of the studio? I think it's fantastic. I think he's done well with the kitchen. <laughs> Don't tell people <laughs> we're in the kitchen. I was gonna say that people wouldn't believe what's behind the actual <laughs> main camera, would they? It looks there? fantastic, really, really good. Um, few, few tickets there, but I'm guessing you're going to be liking what's over my shoulder here. This was the playoff final program when we uh, beat Sunderland two years ago. Great. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Obviously, you were a Geordie. Um, yep, Newcastle, not not Sunderland. I'm not a Mackham. No, so w you were born in. I was born in Newcastle, Newcastle one time. Uh, lived a couple of years at a, at, with my grand gran in a place called Benton. Moved to Shieldfield, which is a, a precinct in Newcastle, uh, near just down from Biker. Lived there for a couple of years in a in a two bedroomed house with an outside kludgy. A <laughs> what? Outside toilet. Um, <laughs> Kludgy, did you call that? Gas mantle is, is the light. And the, the little mantle where if you put your finger in it, you lost the light. The heating in the bedroom and the light in the bedroom was like a Bunsen burner, just a gas pipe coming out of the house. Wow. <laughs> and then I moved to uh, a place called Kenton, which was a brand new, brand spanking new house, which was absolutely terrible. It's getting images of Scrooge there when you're talking <laughs> like about. A, yeah, but I, I mean, it, it, you know, one of the things you learn now because of social media and everything, there's so many people who want and can't have, and the haves and have nots. Whereas then, everybody was in the same boat. You didn't know anything about TV. You didn't know anything about social media. There was nothing. You, where you lived and the people that you lived around was, was your, your targets. That's all you had. And, uh, you know, you, you, we moved to a new house in Kenton, way, away from all the, the family and all the, the friends that we had in, in uh, Shieldfield. And it was terrible. Hated it thrown out of school my mother went went down and punched a teacher had loads of loads of aggravation there it was just a terrible place then eventually we moved from kenton to a place called benton which is where i lived from uh, about seven or eight years of age upwards it was great so when you just say your mother went your mother punched a teacher he slapped me he, he i'd put a book into a i was a nature monitor or something and i put something on a book a, a nat something to do with it I, I, I can't remember what it was it was on the table and I knocked it off, and he welted me with his flat his back of his hand, and it was a really big welt on the side of my face. And my mother went up and in front of the class, just went in, welted him. She says, "Not nice, is it?" And just walked out. Wow! Do you remember that? Oh, I, I, I was sitting in a class. I, and we left. We had to leave. It was a terrible place. It was a horror. It was just. It was a brand new estate, and this is in incomprehensible in today's. Oh yeah, I. Um, this would never happen. Well, no, because the kids have got too much power, but they had no power then. I mean, teachers belted you. I mean, had slipper, cane, everything. I mean, you know, you you got all those things. Um, I mean, I wasn't different than anybody else. Everybody used to get that, you know. But uh, he would slap in my face and, and really mocking me. 
my mother was really unhappy. Plus, it was it wasn't a nice place to be, and she was she was unhappy there. And uh, we'd had my sister by then, and we were re it wasn't a nice place. It was a beautiful house, new house in a new estate, but no no feeling or atmosphere, or anything at all. It was fr friends or families or nothing. And they used to have you been back there? No, not to Kenton. Hated it. Been back there. I, I left Benton when I was. Uh, I left Benton in September. So Benton is where you were born. Benton where I was born. Lived with my grand for a while, and then went to went to went to Shieldfield, Kenton. Then came back to Benton. Lived about two hundred yards from where I was born, and then, then in, a, in a semi detached house. And then eventually, when my, my, my dad left, the house got too expensive, so we moved to a flat. And uh, we just lived in a flat, ate in Glassbury Place until I was 16, left, the, left, joined the Air Force, September 66. So what are these places like now? Yeah, they, they've modernised them. They've got, you know, like you've got the flats, you've got uh, security doors at the front. And we used to run in out the flats and hide and, you know, play, play on the stairs and everything. Now you can't do that. It's all security and, uh, you know, you ring the, like your place, you ring the doorbell to get in. Nice. I, mean, it, I, I had a great childhood. I mean, when my dad left, it was a little bit more difficult, money-wise. But as a, as a place to live, Benton was great. Uh, two really good schools, played football, cricket. That's all you did all the time. You didn't, as I said, going back again, is you didn't have television, TV and you didn't have social media. You know, you just, everybody was around you. All your mates were there. It was, just, you know, great place to live. I loved it. So you, you mentioned your dad there. How old would you have been then? Well, it started, I mean, I should imagine that was probably part of the problem in Kenton. I don't know. I mean, I can't, I, I was still young then. I didn't understand about people getting divorced and separated, you know. That was unusual then, I would say. Uh, well, I, f I felt it was. When I joined the Air Force, um, I thought it was a stigma that your dad had left you, you know. He was lived in London. He lived in Battersea. He'd, he'd gone off with another woman. And um, I thought it was a stigma. Yet, if, of the 30-odd people that I joined the Air Force with, 17 of them came from split homes. Wow. So in the end, I realised that I wasn't that, wasn't that much different. That would have been in the 60s, would it? 66, aye. September 66, I joined. Aye. So, it, um... Great year for uh, football. Uh, we just yeah, well, I just watched Scottish that. Viewers. <laughs> <laughs> I watched that. You know, we were we, 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 you know, really lucky that we used to go to the youth club and that was one of the one places. Cause we all, none of us, not many of us had televisions then. So to go, we used to go to the, the youth club that was adjoining between the two girls and boys schools. And uh, the 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 game was the, all the games were on there Portugal, you know, the, the Brazil, England, Argentina, everything. We just every single day there was about twenty or thirty of us in a in a big room watching the game. Absolutely fantastic, you know. And of course, the, some of the games were held at, at St James's. I think uh, I can't remember which teams actually were based up at Gateshead, and uh, they they came and played at St James. It's good. I, I you know as I say, I had a great time. So you would have been what a teenager, sixteen. 16. So you're born in 50? 49. 49. My dad was 49. 1949, September. So you're 70? 71. Coming up to 72 this year. Oh, my dad's just turned 72. So you are exactly pretty much when my dad's age. So you would have appreciated the waiting area in there with the stones and <laughs> the uh, stones, right. yeah, and, right. and you actually mentioned, because I've got a photo in there of Muhammad Ali, which I picked up from Decorah. Just a little shout for Decorah there. Um, and you boxed yourself. Yeah, I boxed a bit. Um, when you... When I joined the Air Force, um, you, you, I joined as an apprentice at a place called Aria of Locking, electronics, radio electronics, ground electronics uh, operator. And um, we, you know, you, you, the, the apprentice schools used to be Cosford, Halton, Hereford, and Locking. And they played tournaments against each other, and they boxed against each other, played football. You know, it was just a, a general sort of round robin against them at, at various athletics and events and everything. And um, boxing was a... It, it was quite high profile in the Air Force at that time. The Seagrist and the Wakefield competitions. We had, ABA, we had the ABA guy called, uh, oh God, his name just slipped up my head there. But we had lots of um, Williams. Lloyd, Lloyd, Lloyd Williams was number two for an ABA to, uh, with Minter. You know, so we had loads of uh, good good boxers there, you know. And I did that for about 10 fights I had. But it wasn't any fun. You pooped yourself up before you went into fight, and I mean, you what? Pooped yourself, you know. You, <laughs> you, you, you know. I mean, I remember getting. I was, uh, I was over ten stone. I was just under ten stone, 
and the guy who was over 10 stone, he got sick at the night, so I had to go and get away and with a two pound weight in my, in my, in my groin so I could fight the next way up, you know. <laughs> no, they used to rig greyhound races, like <laughs> by floating the dogs out, making them heavier. Or pork pies. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that was true. We used to go, we used to go dog. That's one of the things we did for a while. About, uh, about oh, 1965, <laughs> a mate of mine says, Oh, we'll go to the dogs, and we. I was at the dogs already, but we uh, we used to go at the, the dogs and watch them, and I reckon the guys had so many steak pies, you know, <laughs> for the dogs for pies. So, you used to go to the toilet, you, you used to, can you just explain that one more time, you, about this weight thing with the boxing? You Yeah, well, what, what happened was that I was I was nine stone 11, I was lightweight. Nine stone like, 11? Like, nine, nine stone 11, I think it was, and I had to... Had to put Sound like a supermodel. <laughs> no, I was only a little kid. And then I, and what happened was the guy who's uh, the light welter, he went sick. So I had to go and I put a two-pound weight in so that I could weigh in at his weight and fight with his weight instead. Right. Did you win? <laughs> I won, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I fought a guy from Scotland, a guy called McQueen, who was from Cosford. I battered him. He nutted me in the first round. I lost my nut with him. I went mental. Really? <laughs> Much style to it. It was, it was just standing battering each other in the middle of the gro- middle of the uh, the ring, you know. I, mean, I, I was going to say, we're, we maybe we'll do a bit of sparring in the mirror, but is it? Is it, is it is it's not quite like that in the, in reality. I know, as I've seen you before, you know. When, when What's it like to take a proper right hook? It hurts. It, you know, it, as I say, I, I fought before I got to the, the tournament that I won. Um, I fought a guy who was about two years older than me, a senior apprentice, and he walloped me. And I actually did the saw the stars and everything. Went down on one knee. And, I mean, I got up again, but it really does hurt. You actually see stars. Yeah, definitely. I have a doubt. And, and your, your head starts to go, and you just you just step back and try and cover up as best you can, and then come back at him. So once you've taken that first hit, does that significantly knock the stuffing out of you? No, no, no. You, you don't. The adrenaline. You, you, the hurt, the, the pain only knocks you down for a few seconds, and you, you, the adrenaline then gets you back into. You don't really feel it after that. It's quite strange. Then, you, then you'll you'll wake up the next day and you find you've got black eyes and everything, and you think, well, how'd I get that? Mm. You know, because you got it because you weren't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it back at a neurofin by the bed. <laughs> what was your record anyway? Oh, I'd, uh, oh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't remember at all. In fact, I should remember because when you when you fought, you had an ABA boxing license a little little book that you kept your tournaments in but I can't remember what it was mm. you know they were, they were thick and fast at that time but you used to spawn every second night you'd up in the morning five o'clock run come back go to go, go to the tech your, your college and then then fight in the in the night time by a uh, spa at night ready for the tournaments you know it's good fun so, uh, so how are we when you got into boxing oh I just only did it for about three months mm. in the, in that time and it was uh, I was just I just joined up, so I was very early on because because I was under eighteen. Some of the tournaments were only for under eighteens, so you you boxed until you were uh, eighteen. And but then I got into cricket, football, rugby, all the other things, running, swimming, water polo, did all the rest. Well, what, 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 what were you as a batsman or a bowler? Uh, both, mm-hmm. bat and ball. You do, you do just do everything, didn't you? In life? Yeah, I wasn't good enough at it. I wasn't I wasn't particularly good at anything, you know. But I would try my hand at everything. Mm. I was just average just above average when i joined at school we had guys who played went on to play for wolves went on to play for middlesbrough and everything so i was just a gash average after football i played rugby more than football mm. but when i joined the air force because i was fitter and stronger and uh, a bit quick it you find that you weren't a joe so joe so average you, you know you, you had a bit of ability about you but i had no skill set at football i was just quick and i, I would tackle that's about it you you mentioned um, about growing up there in Newcastle. That had been I don't know. I've actually out of all the grounds I've been to, I've been to about seventy odd grounds to watch Charlton, and I've never been to Sunderland, and I've never been to Newcastle. But I've been to Middlesbrough twice, and that probably gives you an indication of the level of football we played at. Probably. <laughs> now St James's Park was terrible in, in the in the fifties and sixties. It was a terrible place. It was it was no. It was just an old run down place, you know. People but you say that, but there is a certain charm about those places and Elgin here I love Elgin because it's it's it is 100 years old it's still 100 years old but you haven't got 60,000 people to where you kind of make your way to the toilet and you just got to pee on the, <laughs> side, on the stand it's like dribble down you know it mm. uh, pee into a bottle or something it, it was you know I mean it was a fantastic atmosphere the least then we you know and the good thing was when I joined the Air Force and I came back for for leave you could go to go to the game 
and stand as you look at you look at the leases end, the lights on the left hand side, you go at the game, stand to the left of the left hand lights, and six or seven of your mates would be there that you'd gone to school with. Hmm. They, that was their place and they went there every every weekend you know and so you you didn't have to draw with anybody you could just go there and they were there it was great and the atmosphere in then was fantastic you know um, but that atmosphere has gone now because obviously you're seated you know, so it's a, it, it would it. have been like most places I mean Charlton we used to get big crowds back then I mean it would have been a raw atmosphere because, of, like you say, there's no, there would have been no roofs really as such, nope. and and any roofs would have just given it more of an atmosphere, I suppose. Reverberate but the sound, reverberate it, and that was what I loved about the old grounds, and uh, what what I love about Elgin. I know it's like you know you're not getting sixty thousand at Elgin, but it's it's the it's just the look of the ground. I, lo- I love yeah. the old ground, and I do feel it in in the nineties. I've got, I've got my own bugbear about football the way it's gone now, and Sky Sports and the money that's in the game. And um, the all-seater stadiums, you know, self-inflicted. The, the way they're all the grounds were changed. They blame Heysel. They blame Hillsborough. Um, well, but, Heysel, Heysel, I, I don't know why they blamed Heysel. What the problem with Heysel was, if you remember, it was because the police wouldn't go and deal with it. They sat on the periphery of, of it outside the behind the goals and wouldn't go and deal with the problem. And that was where the problem there was. I think it, it, there, there had been trouble with Liverpool. I seem to remember uh, a few European games. Uh, there's always an element that you know follow any club um, that go out to cause trouble. But I think when people look back on the way Stadia changed, they they like to say Hillsborough, they like to bring up Heysel. But as you've just said, in probably both those cases, they were not managed properly. Those Correct. situations, and, and and I understand that we've moved on, but I don't think seated stadiums have, have been the answer. I think seated, seated stadiums have, have killed it a bit. You know, and also that the, one of the you, you just mentioned that the football one of the biggest problems of football was, is the money aspects and that's and and the, and on top of that is agents. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got guys who are pariahs who are just taking, taking, and taking, and taking. And youth, you know, I mean, I saw the figures the other the other week of how much agents are taking out of football, and that money's gone. When we were younger, that money would be spread between the clubs, like when Keegan left Stockport and went to. To, to Scunthorpe. Liverpool. Scunthorpe, sorry, went to, went, to, um, went to Liverpool. That kept Scunthorpe going for years. And what happened was the money moved about the clubs, but now that money goes and fills somebody's pockets. And they, they've got no <coughs> interest at all in the club that the guy goes to. They've got to move their player every couple of years so that they make their, they make their money. I mean, you look what's happening with Pogba, you know, in the way that every so often, you know, he's moving, he's going here, he's going there, Mbappe, Haaland, all these guys. And it's all the agents that are creating the problem. I, I don't deal with them. Well, we we said the other day at half time, sorry, at full time after the Elgin defeat at home to Albion about you mentioned about the kissing of the badge and the shirt, and it's just um, it's just a preset act now, isn't it? Really? Uh, well, I mean, some some of them might be at that, that level. Be, at that, at level. that level. Oh yeah, because the, the, in two years' time they'll be playing against that team. Or even it's not even two years. It, it's year, so it be insincere. False. Mm-hmm. Yeah. False. yeah. Unless unless you're like I mean, unless you're coming from that area. I mean, you watch Boyer and you, you, um, uh, James Milner, you know, um, Peter Beardsley, you know, guys that that have grown up and been in the, in the clubs, you know, and that you fair enough. Milner's moved about a bit, but I mean, he looks a really really genuine character. You know, you, you just uh, probably you probably move because he was wanting games, and so if if there's a, a guy's not a game, he's got got getting out getting a game, he's got to move on, and to try and get his football. But you know, one club men now were practically gone. That's one thing when when I first went to Elgin, you know, we had guys Stephen like, Gerrard. Yep, but they're rare. Uh, yeah, very rare. Aye. And and it's right, you know, I I you know I, I understand that the guys it's his living and he's going to make a living until he's about twenty nine thirty five. How rich do you need to be though? Yeah, well, I mean, they're now talking about that, that, that super agent. I can't remember his name now. Uh, his name just slipped my head. But he's trying to make Holland the first million pound a week player. Yeah, uh, but, Only because he that, wants the money. He's cutting the yeah, money, isn't he? Yeah, well, that's what's happening, though, isn't it, now? Is that um, there's, they're, they're trying to bring that European Super League in. And really... Mino Raiola. That's him. Yeah. Raiola. They're trying to bring in that Super League. And that Super League is to try so that they can afford that Real Madrid can't afford to sign Ramos because they can't afford his wages. I mean, how much were they paying Bale to sit on the bench? You know, they've created the problem. Now, I grew up 
um, many, many years ago, um, I was at a, 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 what they call the Royal Show at Newcastle. And uh, some of the, there was three foot, Newcastle footballers, and one of them was George Easton. And he was one of the guys, along with Jimmy Hill and them, who started, who got rid of the minimum wage. Now, the minimum wage was bad because it was very low, low money. And when you see what football generates, the, the revenue it generates, then players should get their cut. But now it's getting to the point where, you know, you just can't afford it. I mean, look, I mean Man United have something like a 550 million in debt. You know, none of these clubs are not in debt. Well, they've got one less, they have one less chairman to pay anyway. Ah, oh, he's gone. Yeah, Woodward. Woodward resigned yesterday, didn't he? What, what an absolute mess. <laughs> um, a shameful mess. Yeah, but, but, but they're forgetting, like, you know. Because they wanted to shit on the fans. They wanted, well, they wanted more money. That's all the bottom line is. They want more money so they can pay the players that they've got these ridiculous contracts. I mean, in, in the end, somebody's going to have to say, we can't afford to pay. Like, what, well, basically what's happened with Real Madrid, Ramos, Ramos isn't signing because he can't get the money. They can't afford to pay him. Um, Bill, no, I don't know. How, I, I don't know how much these players are on you. You, you. you and I can only read the But papers. these players you're talking about are going to be reaching the end of their careers. They're in the last... Throws of the dice. Throws of the, yep. the, of the dice in their careers. But you think now... You're getting young kids who've not done anything, never proved themselves, and they're getting contracts for two or three years, and they're getting thousands and thousands of pounds, and they're driving around in you know McLarens and Bentley. You know, it just uh, it the, the it doesn't seem to be any realism in it at the moment. It's just the 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 jumping on the gravy train, and they're, they're all really really. One of the things that can. makes me quite sad is the the way that they dictate to their countries as well, because to play for your country would have been an incredible just to get that cap and now it's just means nothing to people well I, I remember think. an interview with Francis Lee Man City guy years and years ago and he said that um, he couldn't understand why why somebody wanted to get paid for playing for their for their country he says I would I would crawl over broken glass <laughs> just to get an opportunity to put your boots on to play for England and that's gone now but the, it's just too much you know I'm not saying they shouldn't make the money you know, because we're, I mean, we're paying, we're paying players at the moment, you know, um, and, you know, it, it, the levels that we're playing and it keeps, it just multiplies all the way up. And there's people, young kids getting massive amounts of money and they haven't done anything in the game. They've never been anywhere, never done anything. And you're just thinking, God, let me, how much, how can you afford to keep on paying that? But they've made a run for their own backs. The ESL. Well. Or, or the whole thing, yeah, because they're, they're paying too much money. But they've got, you've got to pay the money to try and get yourself into that European Championships and the European, um, what you speak, you're called the European Cup because they changed that style, didn't they? They made that a league. It uh, used to be straight knockout. Now it's a league, so you get, you know, maybe 10, 20 million, even if you don't make it through the, the uh, knockout rounds. What is the like, this situation with this breakaway midweek Super League? I haven't checked to see the news. Uh, the, Real Madrid, the Real Madrid guy still thinks it's going to happen. He says it won't happen in the format like it is now, but he... He's on the on the radio this morning, the TV this morning, doing the rounds, saying that he thinks it will happen in some form. But I think it really it, it woke up it woke up the Liverpool and the Man United people because they've come on. I think Liverpool and some two of the owners have come on the on the radio and on TV and apologised for that. They just didn't realise because it's it's you see what what these people do in America. You, you you don't have promotion relegation. It's all franchise. So, you know, you've got people like the LA Raiders, the Oakland Raiders. That's the same team. It's just somebody else has bought the, bought the franchise and moved from LA to Oakland. So now, you, they're even talking about that in our Premier League rugby. <laughs> Sorry, I've just got to answer the doorbell. I think it's, uh, I think it's actually going to be a, a boom arm. So, uh, <laughs> that was the one will stop bouncing around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> same <laughs> magic. That's an on-air <laughs> sign that's just turned up. Oh well, I've got to wear it. Let's just stick that there. Okay. Uh, that's a pop shield I'm going to put on your mic because you're popping slightly with the peas and when you say pa pa on in the mic it pops. All right. So let's, let's stick that there firstly on there. On the big the big occasions. Go on, carry on. Just say something. Yeah. Mary had a little yeah, lamb. Yeah, Mary had a little lamb. She also had a bear. Well, I've seen a little lamb. <laughs> I can imagine some rude ending <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, just going back there to what you were saying, um, 
I kind of feel that I want to see these clubs kicked out of the Premier League. No, well, yeah, but that's unfair on their, their support. What you've got is you've got owners who, as I said, you like in America, it's a franchise. So if you remember, the guys that own Man United bought it on their debt. They bought it on debt. I mean, they've got they've got supermarket chains and everything in big bigger states, and they've they've collapsed. So they but they bought Man United with the debt of Man United. So now Man United is sitting at five hundred odd million in debt, and they need to sort that out. I think people forget they assume that these clubs are, you know, got endless amounts of money, but they they, oh, they no. are all in debt, aren't they? Well, every one of them, you know, the, the, the as I say, they bought Man United on debt, but what they're forgetting is that. You know, you go back to right Munich. You know, you you, you watch there, and you, you you watch the films. There's a there's a uh, on Sky. There's a Matt Busby thing, and I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. The Dennis Law one, and you watch these, and you see you see the passion of the people, and of, of the, in those days when they watched the games, and they they kept the fl- the clubs afloat. It wasn't Sky money then. It was the, you made the money from what you got from business run from properly. The, yeah, from the club. And I mean, I don't think they'd be in the. I mean, work the equation out whether the debt would be the same. But I don't think they'd be in the same debt then as what they are now. Was there bank? Was there things like bank loans in football back then? Oh, I don't know. We 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 couldn't get a bank loan anyway. The banks banks won't touch football in Scotland at the moment anyway. No way. When when we were when we had to go to paying um, a few years ago, the the HMRC uh, snapped down stamped down on the payment of footballers to where. Because at one time you paid, you paid a, a semi-pro footballer in uh, in in Scotland. You paid him for forty-two weeks a year, and then he's in the pre-season. You'd start paying at your first pre-season game again, and uh, so that's all stamped on. Now we've got to pay fifty-two weeks a year, and when that first came in, we had a budget and not, and we had a little bit of a black hole in the budget, and we went for a bank loan and couldn't get one. No way. How long ago was that? Two years. Three years ago. Before COVID as well. Three, oh, yeah, it was three years ago. I think it was three or four years ago. But uh, as it was, it was only a little blip. And, I mean, we, we, we could have survived, but we just wanted to make sure that we didn't go into the the red because when we played the Rangers game and uh, the money came in from the Rangers game, we, we withdrew our overdraft. We didn't have an overdraft because you pay for an overdraft facility. Well, So we just withdrew it because we had enough money in the bank. But things are okay now. How, how many so times did Rangers come here? Was it twice? Was it one cup? Three, uh, three times. Three times. Uh. So was that th- two league games one, and one two, cup game? Uh, two, two. The cup game was at Highbrooks. We played the cup game at Highbrooks. We played them twice at Highbrooks and twice at uh, Borough Briggs. Great, fantastic. Twice in the league. Yep. Twi- four, four times the league all together. Four, yeah. And the cup game. So, can you could you literally survive off of that money for a period of three time? Years. Aye, three years. Wow, Aye, it's fantastic. What from the four games? No, from the <coughs> from the cup game. That's why, that's why everybody sits waiting for the cup draw. If they get through to the like the fourth or fifth round, everybody just sits waiting to see if they can draw Celtic Rangers. And for us, it's probably Celtic Rangers and Aberdeen because they all give us a good crowd. So we, we played them. We played two league games and uh, two league games at home, and the Scottish Cup game in one season. And everybody, it was very very lucrative for everybody in the second division. Uh, Second division, at the third division was it then? Maybe in the third division then I can't remember. It was very very lucrative because really, what happened was when when Rangers got put out the league, they were out of football. They they had no automatic right to come to come back into the league. Mm. SPFL, sorry, the SFL and the uh, Sc- Scottish Premier League SPL, and that amalgamated. Mm. But before that, the SP the SF SFL clubs had to take a vote to see if they let Rangers in. Mm. And that saved Rangers Football Club, mm. and it would give them the due. Ali McCoy and the, and the chief exec, I can't remember his name. They stood and thanked us at, at Hamden when we did that. It was excellent. Mm. It was good times. It was really and and anybody who criticises anything to do with Rangers Football Club or or, or Scottish supporters should have been at all those games mm. and the, the atmosphere. And there was absolutely no <coughs> aggravation. We never had any aggravation at all at, at Borough Briggs. It was just a fantastic, fantastic time for the. the the football club yeah I mean obviously the Celtic fans would have enjoyed their seeing their demise I would think for a couple of years but it's not going to be good you know being a Newcastle uh, you, you are obviously a Newcastle supporter yeah I do um, I mean you wouldn't have wanted Sun- I mean if you you'd laugh at Sunderland's demise of course but you never really want your rivals to be gone forever because well, then you lose you can't, a you massive can't, part of football you can't do that with Celtic and Rangers because Celtic and Rangers the whole of, of Scottish football depends on the four Celtic and Rangers games because that's where the funding comes from. Sky Sky take the games and sponsor us 
to a, a very good level. Not, not obviously not to the level of Newcastle, not to the level of um, the English games, but the, the Celtic and Rangers need each other. I mean, that, that's Scottish football. Quite interesting, actually, that um, neither of those clubs were involved in the proposed breakaway Super League. Well, I would look. I would say that the point from that is that the the view for for people outside of Scotland is that they're not at that level. No. But what they don't understand is that with the if you think when Newcastle got relegated out of the, out of Premier League, they got ninety five million for getting relegated. The whole of Scottish football sponsorship from Sky is twenty five. 25 million so if you if you if you start to feed Celtic and Rangers that money that that the rest of the teams were getting in the, in the English Premier League and what would be a European Super League it wouldn't take long before Celtic and Rangers would be dominating that because they've got fun I mean their core core fashion their core support is unbelievable and that's one of the reasons why I never think they'll ever get it well if they'll ever get into England why do you think Celtic and Rangers are so global considering how every other team in Scotland isn't. Uh, they, they are just out there on their own. And we could, they are on a level with Manchester United globally. Um, and th- th- what is it about those two clubs? What, what makes those two clubs? I, I, would, I, I, I don't know the history of it, obviously, because I've only been up here since 73. But I would reckon that in, in the times when, um, in the hard times when people moved abroad to get work, and emigrated that lots of them moved from the west coast and at the time i mean celtic and rangers were the the teams that everybody if you look up here do you think it's the rivalry that makes that makes those clubs so global globally no i think it's just the popular. fact that they, they were so they were so uh, successful in their time you know i mean you the the when you say you didn't passion. know they don't know the history you mean the because of the rivalry no no i don't know the history of um, celtic and rangers of how they started, I mean, uh, I think the I think the history is something like didn't the, uh, some Irish workers come over into Was Glasgow, like, take the jobs, um, take some of the jobs of the local people, which is where the rivalries sort of started between well, I, the clubs. I, I didn't know that. I, th- I think that's the case. Okay. I, I might be wrong, um, but I, I read up about it once a long time ago. I believe I believe it was Irish workers coming into Glasgow. Yeah. Um, and then that that formed like they, they formed a second club. They were kind of the Celtic side of Glasgow, and then the rivalry I believe starts from there. And there's obviously a degree of religion involved as well. Um, yeah. Oh, the religion. I mean, you know, I come from Newcastle, and you, <laughs> I haven't completely got that wrong. You, you support Newcastle, you know. You, you people. Whereas here, when I first came up here. There's people in Elgin and people all around who support, who travel and go to Glasgow games. They'll go to Rangers or they'll go There's to all clubs everywhere in yeah. Birkhead and Aye. everywhere. And I, I, I can't grasp that. I understand it because, they, you know, you want to, people want to support a team that's successful. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd prefer, obviously, if, if people didn't travel and they all came to Borough Briggs. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I'm obviously Charlton sporter through and through in my blood, 40 years. Nearly fifty. Uh, it's nearly forty-one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just. I'm going to be fifty. You know, in three months. So yes, yeah, forty years. Forty years and eighty. I started, and my dad started taking me. So you, same as me. You, you do that, don't you? You just follow, obviously, your parents. And I've never, never, ever, ever considered breaking away. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, there used to be this uh, kid on the coach for Charlton away games, and he got bullied on the coach. So he used to throw peanuts at him and mock him. And he went and supported Crystal Palace. <laughs> I can't be, we couldn't believe it. But but why would you, you just wouldn't hang around to be bullied though, would you? But I no. mean, that was a bit extreme, going and supporting Crystal Palace. That's <laughs> like, you know. I remember going to the games and, you know, you, you, you went to the game on your dad's shoulders and then the, he'd be standing in the middle of Lee's end. He'd pass you down to the front and you'd sit on the wall. And at the end of the game, he'd walk down, pick you up, put your shoulders and walk out. You know, it was just fantastic. All those, you think, we were just talking about the old grounds and that. You think those grounds stood the test of time for 100 years before they were... And 100 years of being no no safety restrictions. No. Absolute chocker. I mean, I mean, 120,000, was it, in, in Hamden at one time, I believe? So it was one of the crowd records. I mean, there was obviously the... There was a dis, the Ibrox disaster. disaster. Um I've been in crowds where in the back in the day where it's been you have been crushed, but there was an element of oh, just it was it was 
life. It was life, wasn't it? It was you like didn't see many. You didn't see many families at those games. That, you know, when you look at the crowds, it's all nearly um, sort of twenty to fifty. It, it, even our demographic now in Elgin is is quite quite getting on a bit. The the crowds a little bit older. But I think Seaton's killed it. I, th- I think Seaton, totally. Seaton Stadiums is spoiled the atmosphere. But if you're, if you're, it's killed the tribalism. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. The movement. Yeah, but you've now got people. It's like Roy Keane complained about the prone prone sandwich brigade. You know, mm-hmm. sitting up totally. boxes and that. But uh, but if you're paying a hundred quid or something or whatever it is, or two hundred and fifty thousand pound for a box, then you know you want to sit in comfort and you want to enjoy your. Where day do the prawn sandwich <laughs> merchants sit at Elgin? <laughs> <laughs> We've got loads of them. <laughs> you just haven't got the sandwiches. <laughs> No, it's um, it. We've got um, we've got a really, really good setup at hospitality at Elgin. I mean, fantastic, you know, right from Ken Asher's time uh, of the, providing the meals to now David Guidi, and the standard of our actual hospitality, the meals and and the uh, organisation, is second to none. I mean, I've been to uh, Man United twice. I've been to St Johnson's, St Johnson's hospitality, and ours ours compares very, very favourably with all them. Certainly, Man United. It's, you might have the box, but the meal was no better than what you get at Borough Briggs. But uh, the meal is excellent, and uh, Guidi does a great job, as as did Ken Asher. And you know, we 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 need to get back to that because that's that's what you know it's going to keep the club going. Because you can't depend on the the sponsorship. The sponsorship is fantastic. We we do very well at Elgin. We've had a sponsor now, McDonald Monroe, for several years, and he's been great. And in the all the all the the, what what I would call the the secondary sponsors like um, Callum Mackay, Caledonian, and uh, for, you know all all the other people, Riverside Kitchens, they've all they've all really stood by us, and even during this pandemic, they've helped us out, and people have still paid for the signs, and that's that's the lifeblood of our club, you know. We turned down the European Super League, by the way. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't want to go for it. How does a, how how is Elgin? I mean, you said before, Elgin's not cash strapped um, club. How do you keep it going? Because That's, I wouldn't say uh, it's wrong to say it's not cash strapped. What, what we do is we we've got to live within our means. If you if you, you know if you haven't got it, then you can't spend it. And if you've got it, then you've got to spend it wisely because you won't have it for long. And when 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 we first when we first took over, it, in in in, uh, in I can't remember what year it was, but twenty or five or something, I think. But when we first started, we were probably paying an average, uh, now an average wage, and now we're paying double that. And that's mainly happened because of the the pyramid system. The pro, uh, Stuart Reagan from the SFA, um, he decided that he wanted a pyramid system, and the pyramid system is probably a good way to go because you want everyone to have the same chances to get to the top level. So at the moment in England. I think it goes down to 10 tiers or something where everybody can eventually get the chance to go and play in the Premier League. All the, all the football comes all the way up. Um, and I think that's okay in England where you've got a population of 50 odd million. But in Scotland, it's very, very difficult because you've got 42 what I would call professional clubs, even though there's only about 14 of them or, or 16 of them full time and the rest of them part time. So what happened was they brought the pyramid system in and you end up in a situation where you start spending more and more money because you don't want to end up as Club 42 and be the club that's relegated or goes into the relegation fight. And But on the count for that, you've got the teams that are coming through, like uh, Kelty, East Kilbride. Who is Kelty? Kelty's a little village in Fife down down, down the um, in the central belt. Are they top of the... Um, top of the Lowland League. Or they were top of the Lowland League. They're, they're really, what's happened this year, they've just... The two low, the Lowland League and the Highland League have just uh, decided that they'll give the championships to the two clubs that were champions last year, mm. so that they could uh, get into the playoffs. Because it breaking are propping up the league too, aren't they? Uh, they've had a terrible season. Sorry, breaking are propping up league too, aren't they? They've had yeah, a terrible but, season. But, um, but they were they, they were they were championship club not so many years ago, and they've just they've just gone to free fall. But you know it's. I don't know why because I mean they could have dropped out side. last season though couldn't they well no they'd have gone in the playoff last season it's a playoff as opposed to just straight relegation so the, but the bottom team just to explain to anybody who doesn't know the bottom team in Scottish League 2 plays off against the the playoff between the Lowland League and the Highland League yeah so what happens the Lowland League and Highland League play each other so who's top of the Highland League right now There's, well after three games it was Brora right 
So the Highland League, because they couldn't, they couldn't afford to do testing. So rather than do testing, they just nominated Brora as the champion so that they could go into the into the uh, playoffs. And Kelty played, I don't know how many games Kelty played, but it certainly wasn't 50% of them. So then they decided, the league decided that they would give Kelty the championship or did nominate them as the playoff team from La- because they didn't get a chance last year. But I don't, I think that's got a lot, a lot to go yet. I don't think that's <coughs> going to be as simple as everybody thinks because um, it, it's a difficult scenario where you can just dom- nominate you nominate the champions without play, with just playing three games and three other teams didn't kick a ball in the same league. At the moment, they're looking at uh, reducing the social distancing to one metre for hospitality. And if they do that, they're hoping, we're hoping that they'll reduce it one metre at, you know, outside in open air. Well, they have to because they're talking about having full crowds of uh, events and music and football games with, in possibly one to two in two months. Yeah. Uh, well, but in the middle of June, though, that could all change, couldn't it? It I could mean, change. The yeah. new variant that's coming from India. I think. I think getting more and more people vaccinated is helping the situation. I think that's making a difference. Have you had your? Uh, I've had two. Yeah. You've had two. Yeah, I've, yeah, got, I've got my second, first one next week. Actually, I've got my second one on Sunday. So, you know, I think that's helping the situation, but you, you cannot be complacent about it. And I think we'll never ever get back to the norm again. I think that will always be a problem because of the. Um, the risks of, of what, what do you mean? You don't this. think we'll ever get back to the norm? Well, I, I think we'll always always have a risk of this thing cropping up wherever it comes up because it's not going to die. Do you think? Sorry, when you say that, um, do you believe that well, there'll always be restrictions in place, or do you believe that people will oh, no, be I think, aware I think, of it? I think uh, popular uh, populism will take over that. I think the restrictions will have to be taken away, but I still think that I think it'll be a long time before we ra- eradicate COVID. How long do you think? Oh, I don't know. I remember, I remember I grew up in the 60s when we had polio. And we we eradicated polio, didn't we? we with this, I, I don't know. Did you get the sugar lumps? Well, we used to get three sugar lumps over, over about a nine-month period. You just kept to go to the doctor to give you a sugar lump. Surely you're old enough to remember the plague. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Fire of London and the, the Battle of Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> the first time round. Uh, no, I would, that, you know, you, you, the, they'll work on it. I, I believe that they're th- talking of having a pill by, by September, October time. To, a pill yeah, to stop good. COVID. That's one. Is that, if that we happens. don't want to get jabbed twice a year, do we? It's a well, not, pain no, in the bum. Well, no, it does, it's in your arm, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it, to, to me, you know, you, you grew up with BCG and all these injections. Yeah, you I had a BCG. Just get on with it, you know. It, yeah. it, it, everybody starts to panic. I must admit that maybe with all the development they've done, people are probably frightened because this one's coming so quickly. But they should remember that it's really just a derivative of flu. Have you have you been affected at all? You, your family, or do you know anybody who's who's had any problem with it? Um, got a friend. A friend of my wife's was taken. But he, she was taken by the vaccine. She went really bad after having the vaccine. But no, I don't know anybody who's um, who's had the COVID bad. Mm. No, not at all. If you would like to sponsor the Honest Luke Show, please message us through YouTube or Facebook at the Honest Luke Show or by email the Honest Luke Show. At gmail.com. You mentioned uh, your wife, Paula. Um, she's a bit of a guru, isn't she? Um, she she was. Um, what does she, what does she she does she does. I met um, her. I met her. I was it. What happened was between between postings to Ari of Saint Morgan and um, starting my what they call the operational conversion unit. They they had no, all the numbers were coming out of Topcliff, which is the the training base for air electro, electronics operators. They were coming out too quick for them to do the OCU to the Nimrods. So we were holding at St. Morgan. And uh, I was given a job to go up to, to Northwood to check some security documents. And while I was there, the guy who ran the AEO said, look, you, you can go down to a place called Joint Acoustics Analysis Centre and, and wait there for a year until the OCU. Whereabouts is this? That's in Hampton Court. Oh, so this is uh, Surrey? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I played I played for Red Hill for a while. Oh, in, in Gatwick. The East, in the Eastman League, I. But anyway, um, so you were down there for the just holding with the RAF, yeah, just yeah. Ho- just holding. And I went to a place called the Joint uh, Joint Service Rehabilitation Unit, Chesington. So I was living at Chesington and working in Hampton Court. And Paula was, Paula arrived back at Chesington um, from from Germany, and she came in, and I was sitting in the mess, and I was quite a young sergeant. So she was in the RAF. Yeah, she was a WR. I was quite a young sergeant, so I looked, and I I didn't dressed to the, the norm that people expect in the mess. So I was sitting in jeans and a t-shirt 
and she came to me and says, where's, where's the serviettes to me? You know, I said, what do you freaking mean? Where's the serviettes? Get your own. And she thought I was a, she thought I was a, she thought I was a, a kitchen man. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. So, so that's how we met. And uh, it's never looked back since. So then. where's she from? She's from Limerick originally. It's a very strong accent? Or? No, no, no. She's got a, a lovely accent. For, she's lived in Lewisham for many, many years. But she left, left home at 15, uh, went to work in the city and then joined the Air Force. You know, and then she came up here in oh, 74, 75, something like that. 74, I think. She came up here, worked at Gordonston, worked at uh, the, this, took on. For, she was a. What was she doing now? Well, before she came, she came up, she was an air hostess with British. She left the Air Force and became an air hostess with British Carl. And then after a while, she realized she was going to come up and we'd live together. That's a blast in the past, British <laughs> Caledonian. Big Cal, I. <laughs> she was stationed at Gatwick, Godston. Yeah. Anyway, she came up and um, to help make me, we bought a house to help ends meet. She did 35 or six jobs, I think it was, trampoline coaching, swimming coaching, uh, or a fl- selling or a She's a female and version of you and me, <laughs> jack of all trades. <laughs> and then uh, she she uh, went on and eventually opened up a fitness centre, uh, a place called Fitness and Fun, which was, that was the time when the Green Goddess was doing aerobics and Paul had started doing that. And as part of that, the um, the upstairs where we did the aerobics, uh, somebody took that over for a while and started doing live music in there, but they didn't keep it going. They, they, I think they're overspent. So in the end, we took it to, took it back off them, and we started doing the doing the bands and everything, and that was fantastic. And that kept kept the subsidised the gym to allow her to follow her dream and having the gym and everything and do all the aerobics classes. And that was fantastic. So when. Is Paula your first wife? Yeah, I've only been married once. Right, okay. So when when did you get married? 75. 75. So you would have been... 20 20 28, was it? 26. 27. I don't know. I don't worry about age. Do you know what? I would would recommend that nobody gets married under 40. But it's obviously, it's worked (laughs) for you. I'm I'm lucky. She was was great. I mean, but I I married a a lady who who had um, sports in her genes as well. I mean, she was an athletic. She was a, a... netball player England trailers netball she was a, a combined services runner swimmer diver netball player um, she had all the genes you know that's partly the reason I married her <laughs> try and get two athletes a couple of athletes out of her and it worked I did well <laughs> so so what's she doing now she you same retired. age are you no she's two years older than me two years older I, so she retired she used to came up here and uh, got a sister called a sister-in-law called Hilda who came back from San Diego from America and she came to live with us for a while and Hilda had done all the cosmetology and beautician work and hairdressing work in, in uh, San Diego done the college and uh, they decided to open a hairdressing business so they opened a hairdressing business in fact had three or four I think running at one time where, where was that? Uh, two in the high street one in Thunderton Place uh, three in the high street it was and then one in Thunderton Place these were just ha- hairdressing ha- shops hairdressing shops yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but they spread themselves a lot, and eventually the the other ones just closed down, and they had the, they finished off with the one in in the high street, one six seven high street, and that's uh, is that still that's hairdressers? Still. No, it's been sold. They're going to turn into flats, I believe. We just sold it a few years ago. I've been up here since January twenty nineteen, and I have to say <laughs> that I am astonished at the amount of hairdressers there are in Hair, this area. Hairdressers, building societies, and opticians. Not not even just in Elgin, but in Lossie. Mm-hmm. There's a ridiculous amount of hairdressers. Why? Well, what happened? What happened was at one time, you your hairdressers were trained by this by the hairdressing shop, like Kenneth's, Clancy's. They trained the hairdressers, so you you had the, a flow. But then eventually the college started doing it, and then all you're doing was churning out hairdressers. So you've got loads of them doing mobile, loads of them doing opening their own shops and everything. <laughs> but having said that, I mean, <laughs> not just hairdressers, barbers as well. There's loads of barbers, yeah, aye. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I particularly love the one down in Lossie. It's called Hair Force. That used to be in Elgin. Right. Hair Force used to be in Elgin, along beside the Great name. shop. It's opposite that pub at the top end. Great Hair name. Force, yeah. Great marketing. But um, having said that, about there being a lot of hairdressers, they're all bloody busy. Uh, not not recently, but I'm due, I'm due to get mine cut on the 28th. <laughs> it's been four months since I had a haircut. But I've heard people can't get appointments, people right. can't get in, and people are turning up and they're being turned away because now, I mean, this booking system, I mean, are, are those days gone where you could just turn up and sit and wait? A I think it'll happen again. I think that will start again. Talking about Paula, um, 
passions? I mean, she's done a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. What 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 is the, what are the would you say in her life has been the her passion? Um, I would imagine fitness. It just she, you know, she really really was passionate when she opened the gym up. She was passionate in taking in getting people to do heart heart cardiac resuscitate uh, cardiac um, therapy um, exercises associated with that doing aerobics. Has she researched everything. She really really was really into that. You know. So where did you guys get married? 75. Where, 75. Whereabouts? Was Elgin, it up here? Elgin, I. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. Tell us about the day. Oh, I can't remember much about it. <laughs> you pissed. To, no, I, I don't drink. I don't drink at all. Oh, you've never drunk? I have. I've been drunk, but it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a spectacle you want to see. I've been drunk about two or three times in my life, and all I do is vomit. Wow. It's absolutely horrible. Is that why you don't drink? Because... I don't drink because I don't, I don't feel it does me any good. I, to, I remember one new year... And I woke up in the morning, and I had to, we had to go to a, a fondue. And the fondue was about oh, 20 or 30 people at a guy's house in Pilmio Forest. And it was doors on the floor with bricks. And so we're sitting on the door, and I fell asleep underneath the, underneath the doors. I was so bad. Just, I, I fell asleep underneath the doors. It was so bad. It was terrible. <laughs> I remember my dad, actually, um, I think I think on his stag night, or maybe they, they forced the bottle of whiskey down him or something horrendous well, that's what happened. I, I drank I came up here my first sort of new year in Spain I lived in Spain place and everybody saw I just tried you're going to say Spain Palace <laughs> <then. laughs> <laughs> they said oh, you just put some lemonade in it you know and you'll soak it but it didn't help it, I, it absolutely nearly killed me it's absolutely disgusting and I just felt terrible so I, as I say I, I don't find it, it, it do, I just don't like the taste of it it just doesn't do me any, any good not even a beer nah, not even a beer I like chocolate which is unfortunate but so you don't actually even replacing it. You don't feel the need to replace it. You just don't like it. Oh, it's horrible. I just can't stand the That's taste. That's unusual. Of it. No, just got no. And never used to say when I was on. I did a tour on Gan, which was a little island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, about uh, about twenty miles south of the equator, straight down from Ceylon and Sri Lanka. And uh, everybody said to me, "Oh, you, you'll 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 get used to it." So people tried me with gin. They tried brandy. They tried Bacardi. They tried lagers, Carlsberg lagers, everything. And all I did was vomit. And I thought, why am I doing this to myself? So I just gave well, up. Well, if you're getting nothing stopped. out of it, oh, it's, it's pointless, isn't it? Oh, terrible. And then I just, I just stopped completely. It, just, no, it doesn't do, didn't, didn't entertain me at all. I don't mind other people drinking. Paul likes, it, like, have a, likes to have a beer now and again. But it doesn't bother me. You know, I mean, well, at Elgin, we're making money on it. So, you know, you, you want as many people as you can to come and drink as much as they can. Does she bar. go along to the ladies' days? Yeah, she goes to the ladies' days. Oh, she's a... I've heard a few things. That she's sound a party animal. Riotous oh, kind she of occasions. <laughs> she she's, she's a party animal when she gets going. You know, she, she does the cheer. What's that like, though, being with someone, you know, who has a drink when you don't have a drink? Because I think if you've got two drinkers together, I mean, it can be carnage, I know that. Um, but you're looking after her. It's normally the other way around. Yeah, don't bother me. Doesn't, doesn't bother it, you. It doesn't bother me. Too. It probably keeps. It's, it's why maybe I've got some people that uh, I've got so many friends is that I drive everywhere. So people just oh, well, Tats will drive us. So, <laughs> so whenever we go away, if we if, if the guys uh, Henny and Dyson, all these guys Russell Mackay, all these lads, if they want to go anywhere, I'm the driver. So it's probably why they let me go with them because they don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> I married her, and then we had uh, the kids and uh, all the children. Um, I lost one unfortunately, uh, which is. I just don't particularly want to talk about that. But the other two, uh, one's, one's become a really good golfer and the other one was a, a pretty good footballer and then he, he, he got cancer and he I, moved I, on. I did, I did, a, I did see that um, when I was doing, my res- doing a little bit of research. I mean, I know quite a lot about you anyway, but I did do a bit of research and the, the cancer, was that with Graham? Yep, hi. So you've got Graham and... Stuart. Stuart, I don't know anything about Stuart at all, but I know I, I know you had. Did he go abroad to play football, Graham? Graham, well, Stuart went abroad first. Stuart was a golfer. So how was, was Stuart your first? Yep. So Stuart, um, he played a bit of football, then, but he didn't see the football as a way to go. So he started playing golf, and he became pr- quite proficient at golf. And uh, <clears throat> we we were in in Florida at a, at a in a sports shop, knocking a, knocking the ball about, and he was practicing with clubs. And the owner of the shop just came across his God, me, son, you've got one of the best swing I've ever seen. He said, uh, have you thought of coming across to America to play golf? And he said, we looked at him, didn't think nothing of it. And he said, look, I'll give you a card of a, the head coach at Florida State University. And uh, we went down there to see him. 
guy he said look I've heard I've heard you sunk and hit a golf ball but he says hit the golf ball is just part of it you need to do this 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 and this and he gave us lots of hoops that you've got to jump through to become to get to college in the United States so we came back and he just he wanted to do that so we ended up we went to a, a tournament he went to a tournament at Pine Pinehurst the complex at Pinehurst and he did very well there and he was offered quite a few scholarships uh, one of them was with a military college called the Citadel but his maths wasn't strong enough so he was on his way to, this is this is a really good story he was on his way to the States right to go to the Citadel and the college rang up and said look you, you, you're not going to be able to make the maths so he would have gone in the military regime and he didn't want to do that so he changed his college to a place called Pfeiffer in North Carolina same still landing at Charlotte so he arrived at Charlotte and when he got there the, the customs guy says um, oh why are you not going to Charleston if you're going to the Citadel he said I'm not going to the Citadel I'm going to Pfeiffer he says no you're not you're going home <laughs> <laughs> and they locked him up 17 years of age two two big coppers came locked him in a, in a room he'd been regular uh, getting coached by Alistair Thompson at uh, Lossie he, he did have a good golf swing I mean he, he was a good golfer and then he went to there and he did a good career in golf but the difference between being a good golfer and good enough to become a pro is massive I mean mm. we tried we, we, we tried to sponsor him on two or three different tours and it just didn't work out and then he got he got married and then um, his wife Michelle um, took took got took some medication for a um, flu or something and it contracted the pill and she ended up having a baby they were married so you know but, but mm. the baby came and that sort of counted that Kylie arrived and you wouldn't want anything else because she's fantastic she's beautiful so then um, we we he tried to try to continue making the go of it on on various tours Tar Heel and a few of the Hooters and that sort of thing and it just wasn't good. his putting just wasn't strong enough and then he so eventually he had to work and he just developed from there and he eventually came home and uh He's he's got back his amateur status, and now he just plays out the Murray. How, ma how many grandkids have you got? Two, two. Yep, and I'm getting well, just due to get one. I don't know why I thought you were going to say, say like double figures <laughs> there <laughs> or something. <laughs> no, no, just the two. And uh, Graham, what happened was Graham uh, went. We used to go across and watch Stuart play golf all the time, and Graham thought, you know, something can, this looks pretty good. So he was playing. He'd had a couple of games for Elgin. And uh, he played against Montrose or something, and then he travelled to Dumbarton. And when he travelled, he was 16, and not one person spoke to him on the coach. It was terrible. And he came off the coach and he said, Nah. Uh, he, they took him all the way down there, didn't even get him on a game or nothing. So he just thought, You know, something. He came home and he was really upset, and he said, Dad, I'm just going to America. With Graham, um, I'm quite a, sort of intrigued why. Why you didn't name the first, the first one, Graham? Um, well, it didn't. Know, didn't Graham wasn't Graham wasn't coming along. We had Stuart and we had Colin, and then at four years of age, Colin drowned, and then we had another child that we weren't going to have. We weren't going to have two, and then we had the second one. And Paula just we she had real real problems giving birth all the way through to to Aberdeen. In fact, she became part of the uh, maternity unit in Moray campaign afterwards. Because there's still no um, maternity. I think it's just come back, hasn't it? Ward here, is it? I think it's just started again. I think they're just fighting for it. But Paula was one of the people that started that campaign off because she was on her way through. We stopped at three. I followed her through in a car because I was going to do the Great North Run the day after. And we followed her through in the car. And uh, she, she was stopped three times at various car parks to try and give birth. But eventually got to Aberdeen and gave birth in Aberdeen. And it was terrible. Coming from South London, where it's just property upon property upon road upon town, you know, it's same as Newcastle, typical English town. The access, the hospitals, they're all within reach, aren't they? So yeah. so easily, and people up here, we sorry, people down there don't appreciate up here really the lengths people have to go to just to have a baby. Uh, it's changed a bit now, though, because Doctor Gray's now is a tremendous hospital. But they've got to, you know, to get doctors who want to move on, there's not really much chance of promotion up here. It's not like where you've got a huge hospital where you can start developing your talents and to move on. If you want to become a top, top guy, you want to be, you know, in, in, in a top, top, top hospital. 
and Dr. Grizz, well, it's great. It's a good hospital. There's, there's only a limited amount of money, a limited amount of staff that they'll take. So you just, you, you and Paul had, had just decided you were having the two kids. Yep. Right. Um, and then when your youngest, Colin, died, that's when yep. you decided, did you decide to have yeah, I, another I, one? I just felt that, I just felt it was, um, well, we both felt that it was difficult for, for Stuart to grow up by himself, you know. So we just had another child. What was the age difference between Colin and Stuart? It was about 10 years, I think. A bit uh, more. Probably. Oh, quite a... I think it would be about 10 years. So I, I couldn't... I'd be guessing about 10 years, I think. How was how was Stuart affected uh, at that age? Uh, terribly. Uh, terrible. Still now. Mm. Still the same as me. I don't cope with it well. And, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm doing the interview with you now, and that's probably most I've talked about in 20 years. Right. I just don't deal with it. I don't deal with it at all. My ex-wife and I, uh, we had a situation where uh, funny things that you remember actually when you look back. Um, I remember we played West Bromwich Albion on a Tuesday, and uh, I'd just been to the hospital at Denmark Hill, and we'd found out that there was um, an issue at about four or five months with the pregnancy, and it was uh, something that had come up around the back of the neck, and at that time. The hospital were giving us odds on the chances of it being Down syndrome, and I found that incredible because my mate is a gambler. And but to hear you get odds, eighty. And I think I they, thought that I thought Down syndrome was two chromosomes. They could definitely tell you it was Down syndrome. They started off. I remember very, very, very clearly going in and being told there's an eight hundred to one chance that you could be Down syndrome. I was, which is very concerning that someone would actually even mentioned the words Down syndrome. And I think as soon as someone says something like that, you think, well, they obviously, they know something, they've seen something. But then to give you long odds, it kind of made you feel hopeful because 800 to 1 is, is a huge, it's huge odds. Right, big odds. Though. So you kind of think, well, it'll be fine. And then we went back and we had a couple of visits back. And um, I remember going off to West Brom, see Charlton West Brom and um, on a cold night and um, we'd just been found out the odds had just dropped to it was 20 to 1 Jesus so I think as soon as that happens you know you know so we yeah I mean it was a turning point in our marriage did you terminate they gave us um, a period of time to think about it and we couldn't decide. We we didn't know what to do. Um, I think we were both quite anti termination, but we had Jessica who was two, and we just thought in the end that about the life that it would, how it would affect her. And um, in the end, we did decide to terminate. Yeah, which was. The hardest thing. How many months would that have been then? Well, it, it wasn't detected till about four or five months. Oh, so right, okay. we were five or six months down the line Jesus. with the pregnancy. And uh, we had to we had to go in one day and um, she took a pill. And, just and she never dealt with it after that. I, um, I actually, when she gave birth, um, I actually went into another room and saw the baby. You're really unbelievable. No one, no one can come and say to you, I know how you feel. And that's that, what I found is, is, and the Air Force were very, very supportive. I'm not even comparing this to no, you. No, no, it's no, a totally different thing. No, no, I'm just saying to you that people, that people will say, oh, I know how you feel. It must be terrible. I, I know how you feel. They don't. No. So, and that, that dealing with that, my wife dealt with it. My wife went to, to, to um, classes and everything and uh, and how to deal with grief and I didn't and I still can't deal with it now per perhaps in hindsight I should I might have gone to classes but I thought I thought I didn't need it because I had football so I just put myself into football and in my job and uh, it it luckily that we both were supportive to each other in 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 our own way and that survived us because it the you, you can see why marriages and everything can collapse around it because the psychological impact on it is colossal 
absolutely unbelievable. And it doesn't just affect you, 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 how you think about it. It affects everything. Everything, everywhere you turn, everything you do for months afterwards, you're seeing, you're seeing what, 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 and even now, even now in, at Christmas, we just don't deal with Christmas at all. It's terrible. Is, and, is there, a, I mean, do you, do, you, do you sort of feel a burden of guilt in any way? No, oh, no, I wasn't there. I, I was, I was at work, but I don't feel guilt at all. I mean, you know, what I feel that, that it, one of the things is that you, you, I, I don't want to start crying. No, I mean, when I when I say guilt, I mean, do you, in a, in a way that maybe you didn't. Well, you didn't see a draw. You didn't see. I didn't see him. I went to work that morning, and he didn't come home. It's and then you have to go and identify the body. Just no, nah, no, nah, it's just horrendous. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And uh, and it, it, nobody, nobody can tell you how to deal with it. Nobody knows what you do, how you feel about it. It's just an absolute catastrophic event in your life, and it just doesn't go away. I spoke to a colleague of mine um, who lost their son in a, on the A ninety six. Former colleague of mine, actually Fabian, um, was hit by a car a year ago, just over a year ago, and uh, yeah, I mean. I spoke to her a month after it happened and totally traumatised. You've got to try and... You, you don't want to blank it out because he deserved... He was a lovely kid and mm. he, deser- he doesn't deserve that. But you can't keep on going back to it because it keeps on upsetting you. It's really difficult. And I, I mean, I'll take it to my grave with me. And that's, uh, you know. do, do you, I mean, do you, you just sort of said that you, she dealt with it and you didn't. Do you think that there is any... Do you think... you? It's never too late, or nah, do you just? No, nah, it's gone now. I'll never be able to deal with it. Mm. Because that's exactly this the same as me and my ex-wife. Well, just put that grammatically correct. My ex-wife and I, she didn't deal with it. She she gave birth. I went into that other room and I kissed goodbye to that child. And um, I didn't really, after that, look back. If I'm honest, um, because we had a funeral. And I had to carry the little tiny coffin in. And um, we were both there. And then the ashes were scattered in a garden area. And I never went back there after that. Quite close to the house in near no. Rochester, Kent. But she didn't deal with it. And she was very bitter. For And then our marriage really petered out after that. Um, yeah, she well, she's carried that child. And, you know, yeah, I, I can sympathise with her totally. Paula only dealt with it on the grounds of going to, to discuss it with people. Right. She's still still heartbroken, you know. I mean, it does, it, unbelievable. That was a long time ago as mm. well. Right. 84. Mm. Terrible. Never, I mean, go and move on. Graham, now, um, he's now. Well, he, he went to America. Came along. And uh, he was playing football. Do, he went there, first of all, as a, as a red shirt, which means you don't get a scholarship. You just tried out to see if you could get a game. So is that through a college? or? Yep. U, uh, UNC Charlotte and he went there and that was where Stuart lived so he, he was you know you had Stuart around him anyway and uh, within a, a month they just gave him a scholarship said you know we want to keep you and then um, his second year he just started feeling really sick and he was he, they went went to see the, the college doctor and the doctor says oh you're just stressed for exams and he says I don't feel that he says no no it'll be stress and then he was standing waiting to go on in a game stand ready to warm up and he started being sick into the waste paper bin and he says coach I can't do this and Stuart came down out the stand and just took him straight to hospital and they examined him and they thought it was bronchial pneumonia and then the nurse said doctor you need to look at this and had a close inspection of his chest and there was a big bruise there was a nine pound tumour in his chest so they so how old was Graham at this point? 70, uh, 18, 19 so I'd gone to America yep um, specifically for football. the purpose of football yep and he he was at college. Yeah, UNC Charlotte. And he was and he was playing, and he and he and he threw up. Yep, started throwing up. Uh, he'd, he'd be he'd been sick. He'd getting weak. He'd been sick. The thought I th- he thought he dropped a weight. He did a lot of weights. He thought he dropped a weight on his chest, and maybe it caused a, a mm. bruise or something. You know, he wasn't sure. But uh, because he was eighteen, he was a pediatric. And what happened was there was this clinic, called the Bloom Clinic in in North Carolina where this doctor, it was at 9-11, his wife had been uh, flying, she was grounded at Charlotte. The b- clinic was about to close because it didn't have an oncologist doctor. She rang her husband up and said, look, I've just seen this job of advertised, you know. 
and he came and did the job took the, took the oncologist job and then when when graham got cancer he was the doctor there and his his he believed you know it just every it was just a th fantastic thing they had a program called reach out where they had five or six thousand different hospitals reporting back into a central point of all the different treatments and uh, t-cell lymphoma was one of the treatments that they did and the doc the, first of all they said it would be nine months but it took two years eventually and he just went through it and he's touch wood he came out of it clean so this was um 20 because 9 11 is 20 years ago this year yeah all right. so he's he's been well he's still in remission obviously because you never get clear of it so does 9 11 always remind you of graham's cancer or vice versa graham's cancer reminds you because we all remember where we were at certain times and yeah well I, we, I remember in, in 9 11 we were standing in the coffee bar at rf kinloss and watching the aircraft hit the skyscraper i mean that was live but i remember um we flew out to see him obviously because he, he what happened was the um, Graham and Stuart travelled back from the doctor that day and they talked between themselves to try and hide it from us. But um, when you think, that, I mean, probably the, the cost of the treatment was about 1.5 million. And the, the doctor organised a thing called Reach Out where they pooled all their information and everything and pooled all their overtime. And we paid about 10% of that. So they they took on that because in in America you know what the the bills are but they they took care of him and he survived. Of the so six who took who took care of it the, the doctors, the doctors. Uh, they took care of it and the, the six years the six people that went through it with them all all of the five died. Different different cancers though. So what type of cancer was T cell lymphoma? It's a it's a teenage cancer mostly. So how how would something like is it just a they one in no a idea. No idea at all. No idea at all why it happened. Just going back to odds and that, like, it must be a one in a for a well, teenager. To... Well, they just uh, the doc just said you. you know, I mean, luckily, um, he was so fit. He, what happened was they put him in ICU in the hospital, and Paula Paula flew out to see him, and to spend obviously be with him, and uh, she was lying in a bed in the room about two three meters away from him on a on a on a layup bed, and the he was all wired up. And the alarm went off at about two o'clock in the morning. And before Paula got to bed, there was three ICU nurses around him. And what had happened was, because he was so fit, his heart rate had dropped below 40. And the, the alarms went off at, at, uh, his, he, off at 40. He got His heart rate dropped to 39. And the alarms all went off. And the, the treatment he got and everything was just... He'd have been dead in this country. Really? I, or, well, you just said, they wouldn't have the... Not, not because of lack of knowledge, but lack of capacity and treatment. Whereas over there, it was all... It was the, this this doctor Dr. Mark Mogul had organised the Bloom Clinic to take care of kids and sicker cell and all that sort of thing, and it was just fantastic. So lucky, just unbelievable. But lucky in one way, but unlucky in the other way. Unlucky that he got it, but lucky in the way that he got the treatment that he had. Paula flew out, and she stayed there for, I think she was allowed ninety odd days. They tried very hard. The doctors, the state senator, they all tried very hard for her to continue her visa, but she had to fly back. And then she flew back again when she got her visa upgraded. You know, hmm. same what happened to Stuart when he went out there. When he got stuck, he got sent back, and he had to go straight to the British Embassy and get his uh, U.S. Embassy get his visa stamped. Then he flew back out again. But Paula, they, they really tried hard to help her. The, the, just the rules are the rules in immigration. You know, you just can't stay beyond ninety odd days. And and under any circumstances. Yep. But uh, as it was, she got then she got a full a full lifetime visa. Wow. Can you, can you can you remember always feeling confident that Graham would pull through that? Or yeah. Was there any like real low low all the low time? Point? Yeah, I mean all the time. But what happened was that um, we were very friendly with a doctor in, in Elgin called Louise Roy, and Louise Roy was always confident. She said it's a very aggressive cancer. It don't you know it, if if all the cancers they get, it's not a bad one. It'll be all right. And he was, she was really really confident for Paula, and she was great. You know, same as when Paula got breast cancer, um, Louise Roy was there for her as well. You know, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. You, you've, you've just got to accept what's th the cards you dealt. You know, you kind of it's how you deal with it. Mm. You know, it, if all these things are thrown up in front of you, you know. I mean, Paula dealt with the breast cancer. We, what year was that? Um, oh, I don't know. I've I when my son died, I lost a lot of um, memory of recognition of things that had happened. You know, I. I try and blank a lot out, mm -hmm. but um, 
but she had about and she's her family had had a, a history of uh, breast cancer and she was getting checked every six months and found a, a very very about the size of a pencil point inside her breast and uh, the doc just said you know you can either leave it or you can have it off or you can we can try this this and the other and um we would we that was at Alban. She'd been checked out at Alban. We we're just driving back, and we got to just the airport turn off, the old airport. So is that within the last ten years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was this was after Stuart. Had, yeah. Uh, sorry, Graham had grip. recovered. Yeah. yeah. And then we we're just driving back, and I just said, to, I said, look, Paul, I says, I'm I'm not going to be having you coming backwards and forwards every six months to see if you're going to uh, get breast cancer. You've got it. Let's deal with it. So she, we just went and got a double mastectomy. Right. And uh, that that's been solved, probably the best thing we did. That was another thing that could cause a problem, you know, like you talked about losing a child, um, losing, that's colossal for a lady, you know, you has got a body abused like that, you know, but we dealt with it as well, you know, she's very, very um, understanding about all that sort of stuff, she's really, really good. Is there any yeah. kind of bitterness there? From nah, the, she, she's just grateful to be alive. No, damn right, I, plus she's really, all her life's changed, that she's lost her breasts, it's not, it's not a, a major problem, you know. She still looks great. She still, you know, carries herself really well. She, I, I have seen a photograph of her. Oh, she does look amazing. Yes, yeah, she is for seventy-two. Jesus Christ, she's excellent. You know, and and you know, so you you move on. You know, we talk about these things, and I appreciate you being honest and open. Um, there are messages. Did us send out positive messages as well to talk about these things because obviously you just mentioned Paula, you mentioned Graham, and it it should tell everybody. If there is something, even the slightest thing that you feel isn't right, something's wrong, then to get it oh, checked yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Don't be scared. And the thing was, is in, in, in my time, and probably in early, your early life, C was the death word. You know, it was a death warrant. You, you thought. Yeah. That, and, but now it, it's it's getting much better. And that's why I don't mind, you know, giving money towards cancer research and everything, because I think it's so important that we try and eradicate as a disease, you know, to try and get rid of it. We, I mean, we've, as I said earlier on, we've dealt with polio, typhoid, all these sorts of cholera, and we've found things wrong there. And I, I find it astounding that we still we still can't crack cancer, you know, it's for, for the amount of money and research that we do into it. In, in Paula's sort of p position, um, you know, fighting breast breast cancer, is that now completely, she completely free of that? Yeah, I Regular yeah. checkups? Well, you, no, no, no checkups at all, no, nothing. I mean, um, she she wasn't sick in the way that like you'd think with, for someone with cancer it was just picked up on a on a regular check so no no chemo nothing no nothing. just just my dad's my dad's partner um she had cancer breast um, cancer i don't think it was actually no, no, diff um, different, diff breast cancer is different well my dad see. went to all the hospital visits and um she had chemo and lost the hair so she was wearing a lot of headscarves very tired she remember yep. her being very tired and then she took her two years i think to get the all clear from that and my dad now his ms has accelerated and now he's bedridden living living in a, living in a bed in his front room in his house and hasn't been out of the house you know for over a year now with covid and he i spoke sadly spoke to him the other day on the phone and it might upsets me to say this but he doesn't actually want to go out anymore he doesn't want to leave his house. He, sa he said to me, he's got so used to being in that house that he doesn't want to go out anymore. And I just find that incredibly sad. And he's the same age as you. You know, you're full of life. Paula, yeah, I think full of how, life. I think it's how you deal with things, isn't it? You know what I mean? It, and the people around you, we didn't allow it. Um, it breast cancer is different. I'm not going to compare the two because Paula, Paula wasn't sick. Hmm. What happened was they identified it in a regular checkup, said that's what's happened. And then she had it removed, and then within six weeks she was skiing in, in France. Wow! So you know she 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 dealt with it and got on with it, dealt with it. Wasn't going to let it stop her life. A very resilient yeah. woman. Oh, totally. I and Stuart was affected by that as well. Right. Um, I di I didn't know it until I I got a boss in the Air Force called Dave Wilkie, who was a really really tremendous guy. So just such a good lad, and his wife went through a really really bad traumatic pregnancy to where she couldn't have any more children. And uh, he was describing a thing called survival su survivor syndrome. Mm. And that's where, you know, you, you you keep on thinking, why me, why, why him, why not me? And that went through with Stuart because he'd already lost, his, lost a brother and then his other brother got cancer. 
and he's thinking, you know, why, why, why them and not me? So that's that's a totally. It's a it's a this is like a post traumatic. I was going to say PTSD, I'm a, I'm, right? I'm yeah. a bus driver. One of my many things that I do. And if I I one of my fears is that someone and someone has tried to do it actually walk out in front of my bus uh, is that you live with that vision, um, but that's not really the same, is it? It's uh, you. I think he would be feeling that because he's a sibling and he's wondering why he's not being affected by anything. Possibly, I I I, I find. And it's wrong, really, because it's so important to life. But I find it really, really difficult to deal with. It's probably sitting talking here now is the most I've ever discussed it with anybody, and I, and it really, it's still really, it, it, it's got a huge impact on me, and it's very, very difficult. Mm. I lost myself in everything else I do to try and get rid of it. You just have to try and you try and to put it out of your mind constantly. Just I haven't got a photograph in the house. Of, no, there's lots of things that I, do, I don't deal with, you know. And, I'm, and it's wrong. It's wrong. I should be able to deal with it, but I can't. So I just move on. Yeah. Um, with Graham, he's, he had no. Once once he got the all clear, he said no. He's never looked back. No, he's um, he's still got um, the the to get rid of the tumor so quickly. They had to feed a, a lot of chemo into him, and the chemo and the drugs to the after effects have left him in certain, still dependent on a certain drug to try and stop him shaking. Um, and it, but apart from that, that's the only after effect. He's okay. dependent on that drug at the moment. He is still dependent on. Yeah, he just that if he doesn't get that drug, he starts to lose his memory. Starts to, not memory. Yeah, he lapses in memories, and his his hands start to shake and things like that. You know. So how how old is he now? Late thirties. Late thirties, thirty or thirty something. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, he's yeah he's he's good. I was talking to him last night. Everything's great for him. Yeah, he's working for Apple. Does great. He's really got a good job. Have you all been able to get together or, um, as one nope. family? No, just yeah. FaceTime. Really? I mean, that's, that's one great, great advantage. Where's Graham living? In in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, he's still out there yeah. now. One one of the great things about social media, I don't like social media. I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I do nothing. But one of the fantastic things about the um, social media. Technology, yeah. Technology, uh, yeah. Because when, when Stuart first went to America, our first telephone bill was £598. <laughs> Our second telephone bill was six hundred and two pounds. Wow, you remember these? And now, now we just it's free. Face time, it's free. WhatsApps, anything. It's all free. It's a lot of things, though. When you think about over the years, um, you know, when you buy a stereo, for example, like a stacking system in the nineties or the eighties, that would cost a fortune. It used to cost like over a thousand pound then. You had to be really well off to have one. But now, like TVs, like to have a massive TV. Oh, I, Back I, in I'm the day, like sixteen hundred, two thousand pound. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know you can still spend that sort of money on them, but I mean, the quality you're getting. But you can get these screens now for like three hundred pounds. The one in there that we you I, saw earlier, three hundred quid. Yeah. But now technology is fantastic. I mean, you know, we, we. I mean, I grew up in the sixties. I'm a baby boomer, so in 1949, you grew up and you've watched you've watched it move. But the kids that have come in now, the twenty and thirty year olds now, it's just phenomenal for them now. The, the technology is unbelievable. Do you think? Do you think for someone who was born in the late forties? I say the late forties. I was some mate just, just made mate, you nearly eighty. <laughs> um, do you think it's accelerating quicker now than ever? No, nah, no. Nah, you, I mean, remember the space race? Remember right from Yuri Gagarin all the way through the Sputniks, everything. I mean, it's just. I think. I think the computer has changed everything to make it accessible for everybody. I mean, you know, you, you've now, I, I was, I worked at RDF Kinloss for years in, on a simulator and we had a, a, a computer system called a PDP 1170, which 256K memory. Well, now you've got freaking watches that have got megabytes of memory, you know, it's, it's, it's moved fast, but I think the, the computer chip in the computers, which, I mean, it's, it's as, it's as, a, as exciting as the internal combustion engine. And I mean, you know, we still, we still use the internal combustion engine, and the computers is is, is exciting as taking that up. You know, it's just fantastic. Where do you think it's all going to end? Do you think we will eventually be able to <laughs> book trips to the moon and stuff? I don't know. I I, I never think of that. I mean, I, I, I'm sick when I travel, so I don't worry about it. <laughs> I get air sick. Sit when you travel. Tra- sit when you drink. I wonder you stick to tea. <laughs> You're freaking right. <laughs> right. I'm just gonna. I know. I'm just conscious of the time because it is. Uh, you, you did tell us, tell me 11, it is 11 now. Um, do you know anyone in football, like big names down uh, south? Uh, no, 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 I don't. I mean, I, I, 
one of the guys that's been very helpful to me in running the football club and dealing with things is John Robertson from Inverness Cali. He used to play for right. New to play for What's somebody. happening with Robert at the moment? He's just a bit, just some just, time out, isn't he? No, I think it's he, his sister. His sister died and uh, wasn't right. wasn't very nice. So I think he's I think he'll be back soon. Okay. he's been in touch with me, not not particularly because of me, but to deal with other things right. about uh, under twenties league and things like that. You know, but he's he is just a, an absolute thesaurus and, and a complete encyclopedia. He's one of the football. funniest blokes I've ever actually seen. He's good as well. He's but he's he's um, he's knowledge about football. Is you can sit and talk and listen to him coaching, and I remember. Um, when when we let one of our managers go and we were struggling for somebody to take the tra- I could take the training but I knew that the it needed somebody with better better more experience than than I had with the level I wanted to go to and I rang him up and I said will you will you take training for me he said why would I do that I said because I'm asking you he says no I'm not taking training he said I've got I've got other things to do so I says okay and so I arrived at training and there he was standing in Inverness and he took the session I mean he's just a a lovely man, a lovely man, and I've got a lot of time for him. I've got, uh, he does come across very well. I've got a, uh, I've got a photo, well, my son and I were out in Venice. It's a bloody awful match, I tell you. Mm-hmm. One of the worst games I've ever seen, it's Arbroath, and uh, the Arbroath manager, Dick... Um, Dick Campbell. Wow. There's a there's a he's, character. That's football. someone I would tell you what I would never want to meet. Like, <laughs> down at Dark Valley. Actually, like, <laughs> he, him and his brother, he was at, he was at um, Ross County for a long time. He's been around, I mean, a guy... The guy is, uh, again, like John, he's got just so much enthusiasm for football. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, he's, he must be 70 odd. I don't know how old he is, but he's, I mean, he is a, but a really nice guy. Lovely lad. He's a brute, brute looking oh, brute of a just bloke. A, isn't he? Yeah, but he's a really good lad. He's knowledge in football, and he can just, he just winds people up. He's just fantastic. He looks like you know? a massive character. Yeah, he is tremendous. A lot, of, a lot of good characters. I mean, when we had the. Um, Who was the manager of Albion? He was a bit of a character, wasn't he? Oh, I don't know who that was. He was a tall guy. He was yeah. like that. Aye. Constantly giving it. He was. I think he shouted out to Gav, what, you're linesman now? <laughs> I, I heard him shout at some point. But he was Aye. just very gobby. Well, he, I mean, that was, he questioned whether the goal went. He, he was standing at the top end and the goal was in the right-hand side. And he said, he didn't shout linesman, up. was that ball over the lane? And he said, yeah. of course it was. Yeah, <laughs> as know? if the linesman was going to... I remember saying to Kieran at the time... <laughs> Has he got to change his mind now? Oh, yeah, like the linesman was going to say, no. No, we didn't know it wasn't over the line. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I thought he was a bit of a character, but... Um, McCoyst, McCoyst and Walter Smith, were, were, when they came up, they were brilliant. Um, you know, you, you get, you see them on TV and you, you forget they're just people, they're just normal people. And one of our supporters, Stephen Scott, came across and said, hey, would, would you mind if I got my photograph taken in front of my sponsor's board, Cleaner Oil? And um, as they walked across, Ali and, Ali and Walter turned to me and says, Chairman, you're not going to tell us the game's off for tickets, is it? And I said, no, no, I'm not saying that. I said, he just wants to get his foot in. They went across there and stood in front of the sign with him and everything. You know, just just nice things to do for people. Yeah, you know? and totally. And, the, and, you know, Walter, Walter and Ali were both excellent people. What's, what was Smith doing these days? I don't know. He went to hospital, didn't he? He was in hospital a while a few weeks ago. COVID? I don't know. I don't know what it was. I know it, was, it wasn't, uh, it was, I don't know what it was. He went in hospital anyway. But he's a really nice guy. He is tremendous. I've been to a function with him down south. A friend of ours met him at Loch Lomond Golf Club and became quite friendly with him. So have you ever met um, Alex Ferguson? Just just on an aircraft, not not talked to him. Just said, shook hands with him. I didn't even shake hands with him, no. Just said hello to him, that's all. He, I remember myself uh, always wishing that he'd been given the England job, actually. Well, I, um, I, I don't know if they give it to a Scott, but... Well, I don't see why not because well, most of the, lots of the good managers are Scots. Came to you, bloody that, Italian, didn't they? <laughs> that breed, that breed that came around from Shankly, uh, Ferguson, and Busby, and they, where they all came from within you know, within miles of each other, they were they were managers and a half. I mean, Busby, if you watch his that uh, article in Sky about him, that Discovery article is fantastic. And Shankly was another one, you know. It's quite surprising. Scotland, didn't, why has he never managed Scotland? He, he must have been offered the job. He was. Did he not do interim for a while? Well, Alex Ferguson. I think he did. I can't remember. Maybe he did, but yeah. he was such a what? <sighs> but you, you know, Summick, it's a poison chalice, isn't it? Scotland job, isn't it? Any, any international manager has a poison chalice. You, because you, you, it's not you, it's not your club. And all you do, and you mm. know, you, 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 it, everybody else is back and call, waiting for the players to see if they're going to be available for your squad. Very, very difficult, that one. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, I would, I'd consider Scotland and Wales to be, although Wales are probably 
now would be considered to be slightly the better country in terms of football because they made it that little bit further in the last tournament. But when you think of the players Scotland have had over the years, they've just never come together as a team, have they? But they've had some amazing, amazing players. Well, I mean, they, they qualified for the 70... But they've never gone anywhere, though, beyond the group stages, have they? No. I mean, they've no. had Kenny Dalglish, they've well, had uh, well, Dennis Sunes, Law, Dennis Sunes, Law. Sunes, Sunes. Archie Gemmell. Incredible players. Oh, John Robertson. Yeah, but why have that never? Maybe just not under the right manager at the time. But I look. think another thing is that at that era there was a lot of good teams around. Brazil were outstanding at that era. Mm. Remember, Argentina were outstanding in that era. England were poor; they didn't qualify for either one of those two tournaments. You know, so you, they didn't you, qualify in seventy six, did they? No, seventy four was the nineteen seventy uh, was the last s- one. We we got to seventy f- by being by being holders, and then we never qualified for seventy four or seventy eight. Sorry, seventy was. 70 was the year that Bobby Moore got caught up in that nonsense in the jewellery store yep. in South Mexico, America. Mexico, wasn't it? Mexico. Anyway, somewhere anyway, yeah. Um, and that completely, I don't know if that, de- I mean, you would remember this, I wasn't born, but did that derail England that year, would you say? No, nah, they got beat by um, the, the, was that the Maradona? No, that wasn't the Maradona. No, no, that was 86. That was 86 right. No, they, they were, they, was, was it Gordon Jeff? Banks pulled out a save, didn't he? He's he Pelly. Like bottom right tackle tipped over the bar from a line. I think they got knocked out by Brazil, didn't yeah. they? I think was I think they drew with Brazil, but it wasn't good enough. I can't remember exactly. But that was seventy, and then they didn't qualify. Didn't qualify 74, 78. Scots did. Eighty two was. I remember being quite disappointing because that's that's my earliest memory of a World Cup. I remember seeing Scotland get knocked out, and I was more upset seeing Scotland get knocked out. Interestingly, in eighty two. Yeah. Where was eighty two? Eighty two was in France, was it? I can't remember. But 86, I mean, I was under, underwhelmed by 82. 86, I was playing cricket um, the day of the Maradona incident. Another place, you know, when you think back and remember where you were. Where were you when that happened? I was watching it. In the house. Aye. In the house? Aye, terrible. Aye. I mean, we, you can't understand how we could miss it. That's the thing. He's always, Maradona, before he died, he's always kind of almost mocked, mocked it, you know. He's admitted it Aye, well, indirectly. Yeah. But he said hand to God, didn't he? Right. Yeah, let's move on. You can't live in the past, can you? Well, you know, that. it's um, it's this it's all talking points, isn't it? You know, it's like the Lampard goal and the other one where it's two foot over the line and didn't get the goal. And then they brought VAR in. What's your opinion on VAR? I mean, I, I don't see us seeing it Elgin <laughs> in the very near future. I think, well, it's not coming Scottish football because I don't think they can afford it. But um, do you think that's wrong though? That 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 um, that different leagues play by different rules because. The Premier League playing under VAR, it's not in the Championship, is it? I don't think it's in the Championship. No. Certainly not in League One. But it's kind of it's a different game, isn't it? It's uh, the, no, I think they're losing track of what it's about, and they can't even get the VAR right some, so sometimes. So they're losing track. It should be clear and obvious, and now they're using it to to stop them making bum decisions. One of the big problems with television is all the pundits, and now you end up. When I was younger, much of the day used to come on, and you get you get the game. And you'd get um, Jimmy Hill or somebody doing some little chat about it. But now, most of the most of the programmes are all about the pundits giving you commentary. And, you know, you, you watch it and then they're telling you all the, all the, oh, this, that and the other. And it's a job for ex-pros. And really, you're hardly seeing much of the game. But what they're doing is they're ripping the, they're ripping the officials apart of what they did and what they missed and everything. So they're trying to get around that with VAR. But VAR's not doing it. You've got ex-referees sitting in the VAR. Mm. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. American football took it away. Remember, they had that in American football for a while, where these the guys to go to a, a, a camera on the pitch and put a curtain over his head and sit and watch it. <laughs> and uh, but they stopped it all now. I think football. I mean, when I say real football, proper football, the working man's game, it's died years ago. Um, Not at our level. No, it's, no, it's, you're right. At the top actually. level, it's died because the, it's it's died too in much money. It's died in League One in England. Is it's, it's, I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, because Charlton, twenty-seven thousand all-seater stadium. I'm I'm so I'm a such I'm so anti seats. I, I I was brought up to stand on terraces on cold nights, getting wet, jumping around. You know the atmosphere. You know smell of fags in here. I don't smoke anymore, but. You know, eat you know peanuts and monkey nuts and that that I was brought up to do that. And the old grounds, they were like every 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 ground was unique. It had something about it. If you tell me any club that I've been to, I'll, I'll pick out something that I remember as yeah. a childhood memory. 
and it was a, a, a it, it was I, I don't know um it was something about them old grounds i mean i know there was just, we've had disasters we've had bradford and uh, things have had to be modernized but you said it earlier on the terraces losing the terraces is such was such a massive like ripping the heart out of football and um and it's not going to come back from it because it's never it, going to come back it's um well, no. If you watch it now, you've got a safe standing. Yeah, but you know you've got mean? more people. Apparently, from what I'm told by the by the, um, the 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 press, is that there's more people from outside of Manchester go and watch Manchester United <laughs> than Manchester United support. Well, they're cities. So, they're cities. Cities. City Man fans. City's got lots of, of fans, but I mean that'll change. They've had success now in that money. And, and the thing is, now to run a football club, you've got to be a country. You, individuals like. Um, Ashley and those people like that, they kind of they kind of compete. I mean, you look at the Count Princes. And I mean, I'm hoping that uh, whether I agree with the human rights or not, I don't care. But the bottom line is that I'm hoping that somebody takes over from Saudi and takes over Newcastle so we can get back into that sort of level. Really? You know? right. But, do you know, I'll just mention it now. Um, Charlton won 6 0 two nights ago at Plymouth Sorry. Argyle. And um, I was chatting to a mate afterwards and I said, Nigel Adkins the new Charlton manager. Um, have you ever met Nigel? Yep. No, I've never met him, but I've seen him. Well, he he took Southampton out of that league. Um, oh, Southampton was struggling maybe 10 years ago. And um, he moulded a superb team that just flew out of the league one, straight into straight straight through the leagues. Into, and then they became, they've become a decent uh, Premier League team. So Nigel's taken over. I think a lot of people were a little bit underwhelmed at the start by the name. I think they were hoping for it, but I don't know what we expected. But uh, you know, I said to I said to my mate, you know, he's hit the ground running. He could take Charlton straight into the Premier League and do exactly what he did with Southampton. And my mate said, I wouldn't even want us in the Premier League the way it is now. Do we really want to be there? And it's sad when you start thinking like that. But is it is it is it you know is it the place to be? Is it the be all and end all? Or well, it has to be if you want to play. If you, if you want to, if you're playing a competitive sport, you want to play the competitive sport at the best level you can possibly get to. But you also want to enjoy your Saturday afternoons as a supporter. Oh, you're looking as a support. I'm mm-hmm. from the club's point of view. They oh need yeah, to totally. be at the Top end. They need to be at the, in the in the where the money tree is. So Do you know? Change it. As a supporter, I would rather have um, a uh, a ground that was eighty percent terraced and be watching. Rubbish football in the third tier. Um, just we're going along, enjoying the experience of you know what I grew up watching in the eighties. You know terraces, singing, you know proper football, um, than than watching Charlton playing the Premier League in front of twenty seven thousand prawn sandwich munches, as we've already discussed, getting stuffed by Liverpool, Manchester United, Manchester City every week. Yeah, but it's it's not about anything to do with no it's all money everything everything associated with football is money so you know you get the like we pick steve gerrard as a one-man club uh, a one club man and you know you you look at around it but mostly now <laughs> he might be a one-man club <laughs> whatever that means most people come in most most clubs now are are, are just bringing in people in the premier league you, you're gonna you're gonna be outstanding to be able to, i mean Foden's come through um, the boy Gilmore at Chelsea possibly may, may come through. There's a couple of others that will bring through from the youth systems. But n- now what they do is just go to Africa or go to France or go to Italy and pick up known players because they can't afford not to be in the Premier to wait not be in the Premier League. Mm. Pardon me. What's that? that? Just over there. Just over to look over your shoulder there. That Chal- that's a Charlton Elgin towel. <laughs> Did you notice that? <laughs> no, I didn't that's notice That's a, a, be- a beach towel I had uh, made, uh, um, made up. And I think it's uh, Charlton fans were making them up for Charlton Rangers because there's the, an affiliation between Charlton and Rangers. But there's, right. a, there's, a, there's an affiliation between most clubs and Rangers. Anyway, <laughs> I've noticed the Elgin Rangers bad actually in your uh, merchandise. But right. yeah, that beach towel, that beach towel there, that Charlton loyal Elgin City beach towel is probably the only one in the entire world. And it would be great to see that around Borough Briggs actually <laughs> some sometime. I'll have to bring it along. Aye, maybe. He's <laughs> but I mean, I was just uh, just saying. Going to ask you, um, as far as the future is concerned, how long how long do you think you will stay involved with the football club? Just just until just until it be, I, I will you know become worthless. So you, you know? till you because you are you are Mr. Elgin really, nah, aren't you? Uh, you are I, Mr. Elgin City. Ah uh, no, the Cecil Cecil does is, is is unbelievable. Cecil does a lot of work as well. You know, I mean, it it it's all it is is that 
I'm not rich. I'm not rich, and I can't so I can't put money into into the club to make it better. But what I can do is I can give it a lot of energy. So I I spend most of my time down there, and we do lots and lots of work. You know, the shed. Do an awful lot, actually. Yeah, doing loads of work in the time that you've been in. I've seen, seen loads you of stuff, oh, right? every day. I run past the ground every day, and most of the time you're doing something. Yep. Yeah, so as, as long as I can keep on doing that. But eventually, eventually, if, if I feel that if, if the club want to progress and go forward, then they're going to have to find someone who's got massive investment because mm. I can't do it. Is there anybody there that's potentially? No, not no. at all, no. It, it, you'd need to be, I mean, the, look what Queen's Park have done. No, that's the boy, Hohe, who used to be in charge of Celtic. He's he's taken Queen's Park on and, and done it with them. We just haven't got the money. And but it's, the finances, but you can't spend what you haven't got, as I said to you before, because the only thing is, it, it, you've got to look at the model with Gretna. Before you came up here, Gretna were a side that came from the, uh, the, the Borders League. They got in the Scottish third division. They got voted in. A guy called Miles Gransden, who had lots of lots and lots of businesses around Sunderland area, he brought in, um, it, it brought it right through, took it right through the Premier League, got the Scottish Cup final, and then the money dried up. He, he got a bit dementia. But you say that about said, you say that about money, but Charlton Athletic, um, 1984, went out of business. You know, we lost the ground. I had, I had a season ticket at Crystal Palace. I had a season ticket watching them at, you know, we're lucky to have a football club, but we had a manager then who you might remember, Lenny Lawrence. Right, Lenny Lawrence up, yep. He went to Middlesbrough in the end, took Robert Lee within the sod, but um, Robert Lee, or no Robert Lee. Newcastle. Great Newcastle player, but Robert Lee was one of my bo- boyhood heroes, like Paul Walsh. He left or, Newcastle to go be, be with his family because his child had a, um, a disability. Right. Okay. He left Newcastle. I, he, he I think he was player. pretty much at the end of his career, though. Good in, player, though. Oh, right. fantastic player for Charlton. Absolutely phenomenal player. And uh, he was in the Keegan era. Yes, mm. and he he scored the last goal at the Valley. All right. Um, in 1984 against Stoke in a two nil win. Um, when we left the Valley in front of a pathetic crowd of about four thousand because they most of the ground was then deemed unsafe by the council. And uh, Lenny Lawrence, uh, some absolutely in my lifetime, people say about Kirbishly and that for me, Lenny Lawrence was was the man because I, I was a teenager when Lenny was manager of that team, and we we I turned up to watch Charlton play Crystal Palace on a Saturday afternoon. They had local rivals to be given a program with an insert in it saying we're leaving the valley, which was sort of heart out of you to read that. You know that was our ground. You know I love the valley. And um, but it said we're going to share with Crystal Palace. It was, it was sickening. It was absolutely sickening. And we only had a few games there. And then we were all of a sudden we were having to travel on a number seventy-five to fucking Norwood to watch Crystal Pal- uh, at Charlton at Crystal Palace. Which and, and we lost a lot of fans because of that. Well, you both do. Um, we lost a lot of fans. But do you know what, Lenny Lawrence that season he had a very average team. And uh, but together they were superb team, um, amazing team. But if you look at the names on the on the paper, there was no one, no big names on there. But they were just an amazing team under an amazing manager who got them out of the, the old second division into what is now the Premier League under those circumstances, without a ground, with players like that, with no money, with nothing. And that is why I always believe that you don't need money. You just need the right mix. And you said it the other day after the Albion game, the mix isn't right, something's not quite right. Or it wasn't that day, that's for sure. Yeah, but luck definitely. wasn't on right. the Elgin side. But I I just look back at that Lenny time and then players. Yeah, you know, but Rob, you couldn't stay in there. You could, it's not sustainable. You need the money to be to be sustainable in that Premier League. Well, we, we stayed there for a few years. We, yeah. we, we Probably for the, the, the second half of the 80s, we were there more often well, because we went down, we came back. You That's know. what I'm saying. To you. It's very, you, don't want to be, you don't want to become a yo-yo club like West Bromwich, Albion, Fulham. You know, you, 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 and to stay there, and what, what happens is the rich are getting richer. So the top end are getting... The, 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 if you see the prize money in the Premier League, the, the top end get a vast amount of the money so that the bottom end, although when Newcastle went down, they got 95 million and they could afford to stay in the first division and, and, and get back up again, a championship, sorry, and get back up again and they come straight back up and kept a full-time team. If a team like Charlton could build and get out of the league on, on what was pretty much 
adrenaline probably momentum and just having a good group of players that weren't getting paid much it, well, no one was getting paid then anyway the club went into liquidation no, I mean, there were players there was famous photos of Terry Cale sitting on a beer crate outside the valley where they got locked out no one had any money people were playing for nothing but they got out of um, the second tier into the top tier of English football so that's that's what I've, I just think well you know Gavin could certainly get from what I've seen of these of Elgin I could get Gavin could get the team out of League Two into League One. I thought the season would have been our season because we were really good until the lockdown, and then the lockdown we've just been so inconsistent. That's a problem. Um, we're not a bad. You don't become bad players overnight. It's just that what's happened is during the lockdown, like um, <sighs> um, Albion have got about six or seven new players. Brigan have got eight or nine new players. Everybody's strengthened. We've strengthened as well, but we lost we lost the left centre half, which has made a big difference to us. And I think that's one of the big problems that it's been. Hmm. So, I mean, well, how far realistically do you think Elgin can go at any time? I mean, well, I think it goes. I mean, Ross County proved you can go as far as you like. True, yeah. And but Ross County again have got um, Roy McGregor from Global. I mean, the guy's you know he's he's really sponsored. He's done fantastic job with Ross County. He's never forgot where he came from. He's got it as a community club, but he's willing to fund it and keep it going. And uh, they pay way, you know, punch way above their weight. And Cali Thistle have done well, and they will they're you know they could end up being a Premier League club again this season, if not next. So, but again, it's money. Cali Thistle are struggling money wise. So, really, what you're saying is that once you get out of, you know, you've you've obviously you've said the other day you've got all these players at the moment that you've got for two years signed them up for two years Yep. so what you're saying is if you get out of League 2 into Scottish League 1 you've then got to invest in better players um, and that's where the yeah that's you, the you've got to try and sustain it it's got to be sustainable because you don't want to end up being a yo-yo club because you'll lose people want to come and watch success mm. so while you're going well you'll get we 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 could have up to a thousand two thousand people in Borough Briggs if we're going well well how, how, if, we, if you get out of League into League 1 what you get in at the moment on average, 600? Yeah, about that time. So I don't think it'll increase much. It won't. I no. don't think it will no. either. No, because it's not the, the attraction. You've got to get into the top end mm. to get the attractive teams like Dunfermline in the championship yep. and Cali and that sort of thing. But even when we played Cali, we took about 1,300 supporters through to Cali in the Cup. And there's only about 300 Cali supporters there. Mm. You know, so it's, you know, you, you've got to, it's, you've got to find an investment. You've got to find investment, but it's not the model that we, we're willing to take at the moment. I think I'd better. Yep, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. But uh, it's been an absolute. Uh, it's going to take me ages to edit this. Thank you very much. <laughs> but no, I appreciate you being uh, open and honest about everything. And um, it's been great to talk to you. And um, I don't know what I'm supposed to do at this point because it is the first ever show. So I'm going to get into a, a routine of uh, what I should say and what I shouldn't. Graham, thank you very much for joining us on the Honest Cheers, Luke mate. Show. All the best. Thank Cheers, you. Thank you very much. Hope it goes well. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. Thank you, mate. Really good. Jesus. I'm supposed to be bloody air. Put the TV up. All my people right here, right now. If you have an inspirational story to tell, or know somebody who does, or would simply like to come on the show to promote your product or brand, please message us through Facebook at The Honest Luke Show or by email thehonestlukeshow at gmail.com.